<laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for a kind introduction. Thank you all for uh, being here. And this is a problem that we, you know, the collective, we are going to solve uh, this generation. And so that means that you, the young people who are in the room as well, are the part of the we that's actually going to do some of this uh, work. And I'll give you the good news and the bad news about uh, road traffic injury. But this is a big problem. And it's an important problem. And it's a solvable problem that we haven't turned our attention to yet. Um, and the WHO in 2004 uh, put out these posters just summarizing what happens on the roads on an annual basis at that uh, time. So the roads bring us across the world 1.2 million deaths. Today is 1.3 million. They estimate 50 million disabling injuries. So take your death number and multiply it by 50. There's the disability. And here's the kicker. 90% of that is happening in uh, low-income and middle-income countries. And that's where the economic development is bringing the kinetic energy that brings this death rate as well. So this is a growth industry, um, if you will. The WHO came around to setting a decade of action for road safety, which we are well into. And these are the projections around fatalities, which by 2020 will have risen to uh, 1.9 million a year if we don't do something about the trajectory that we are currently on. The idea with the decade of action was fairly simple. It was saying we know some things about road traffic injury and we're just going to implement them. We're not going to discover anything new we're just gonna start right now and implement what we know. And what will happen if we implement what we know today, and what will happen is that we can make an inflection point and a trajectory that brings us to reduce the death burden to half the projected amount, and that even in the course of the decade, prevents five million fatalities. So there's a huge potential here to take what we know and I'm going to tell you a little bit from my perspective about what we know about road traffic. What I'm going to do is take you through the epidemiology. I'm going to introduce this little concept called transportation health, so that when you think about road traffic injury, you think about it in the whole and in the positive rather than just in the negative. It's healthy for people to be walking around. But if injury is a barrier to that, then we're not going to have healthy people for all of the other chronic disease questions that, that we need activity for. And then I'm going to go through the different child populations, and I'm going to focus on some of the research that I've done rather than giving the broadest of overviews, but I'm going to talk about interventions that are effective for pedestrians who are most at risk everywhere, for child passengers in automobiles who aren't particularly well protected, and for uh, cyclists, because that, that should be a growing area of healthy activity. So here's the epidemiology. Um, here in uh, 2010, 1.1 um, million uh, road deaths in low-income countries and 163,000 road deaths in high-income countries. This is a low-income country, global health, burden of disease, size of a problem. If we look at the child deaths from road traffic, well, it's a good thing that children are relatively safer and a smaller proportion in the high income countries, but it's a bad thing that somehow 193,000 children died last year on the road <coughs> in a completely man-made, manufactured, non-natural environment. This isn't Ebola. This isn't something that nature deals with. This isn't in our genes. This is what we did. We built roads, we built cars, and we're somehow managing to kill 200,000 kids with that system of oops, because we didn't mean to do it, but it's our system and we can change it. If you look at the global burden of road traffic injury, which is our little orange uh, wedge, uh, 81 million dallies in 2010, so it is similar to the dally size of HIV and TB, which get clustered together, or maternal and child health, or malaria, all of these traditional province of international health uh, type of considerations, road traffic injury by itself is roughly similar in size 
And road traffic injury with other causes of injury is actually getting up to be bigger in terms of disease burden than what we think of as the traditional global health diseases. So I think road traffic is a low-income country problem, and I think road traffic in terms of its burden is on par with all kinds of things that we have given ourselves tremendous permission to go after. For those of you who are now interested in doing this for your career, close your eyes and cover your ears for a minute, <laughs> because this is where the funding stands at the uh, moment. This is billions of dollars spent on the various aspects, and you can see that um, HIV and tuberculosis uh, takes a very substantial amount of the global funding of, uh, for, for uh, health, uh, as it should. Maternal and child health, again, as it should, takes a very substantial amount. Malaria, a relatively smaller amount. And support for the health sector is the only subcategory where $1.3 billion is being spent on health sector support. Maybe some of that is getting through to road traffic or to other injuries, but there are no line items for spending international health money on road traffic, to which I add the very important word, yet. Okay, so, so what about these child populations at risk? When you're thinking about pedestrians, you're thinking about a transportation system which, in this country anyway, is dominated by this thing called a car. Uh, you can also get around pretty well in North America on a motorbike. Walking and cycling have all kinds of um, advantages as far as chronic conditions are concerned, and as far as congestion and urban quality of life and so forth are concerned. And then this background of public transit that supports some of these things and competes with others all needs to be thought about in a holistic way when we're talking about transportation. But there's a dilemma here if you're thinking about what to do with a child. If I come and say, let's talk about road traffic injury prevention, and you find out that your child is at their greatest risk as a pedestrian, you'd say, well, don't do that. If we want to talk about health promotion, if we want to talk about the fact that on this continent anyway, what the children need is daily physical activity that's built in, and what they need are physical activity habits, healthy commuting that are going to last a lifetime. And this is the same cohort that's going to face diabetes and heart disease and cancer risks related to uh, inactivity. And we actually want to get them walking. So we've got two things going on kind of simultaneously. We've got a health promotion approach that says, let's get the children walking. And we've got an injury prevention approach that says, you can't do it, it's not safe. And it's the same population. And it's the same built environment that actually moderates both of these things. And it's the same denominators. And so I think these, these things actually need to be considered together. And here's how I think of walking. Walking is like a risk factor or a benefit factor. I am thoroughly convinced that the health benefit of walking, uh, if you promote it, um, far exceeds the injury risk of walking. But we don't measure it well for particular populations. We don't measure the exposure particularly well. We don't measure the balance particularly well. The injury risk we're starting to recognize because it's very immediate, and the health benefit we're not picking up as well because it's sort of longer term and prolonged. And looking at what happens with walking as well, all of the secondary things, how is the, how is the environment, who owns the street, how is society functioning, what's the daily quality of life, all of those considerations go into this same field of study. So when somebody says, talk to me about child pedestrian injuries, um, I think you still need to think about all of the chronic disease people and all of the urban people who are going to talk about walking more generally um, and about people who can project the, the benefits as well as the risks. In Toronto, um, I found out that we don't know very much about walking and looking at the, the child's journey to school as um, the you know, all, all of the children go to school, they've got the same uh, destination, and all of them in the public district are meant to have a school within walking dis distance off their house. So, house. so at least conceptually, that's a very reasonable place to, to, to start and look for these relationships and say, if children are walking more, does it mean that there are more uh, collisions, uh, crashes? And also to say, can that relationship between walking and crashes 
be changed by changing the environment in which children walk. So what we did with this observational study is we worked with uh, 118 different um, school uh, catchment areas, all for elementary schools that had the same grade combination, kindergarten to six, so that we knew who we were watching because we need to go out and do observation. So it doesn't cover the entire area of our city, but it covers what was the old Scarborough School Board, which is a suburban area with a very wide uh, range of uh, affluent to deprived neighborhoods, and it covers the old downtown um, core, um, which had a similar approach to structuring their age ranges, and it gives us one kind of dense environment, one kind of uh, more sparse um, environment. And we went out and did um, direct observation of how children arrive at school and find out that actually in our city, if you look at the quintiles, um, we go from as little as a quarter of the children and in the lowest quintile, sort of less than half of them walking. And in the highest quintile, 80 to actually 100% of children arriving at school on foot. So we've got action all along the available uh, proportions, there are high, higher walking and there are lower walking schools, and our median is actually where our target is, which is we want two-thirds of the children to be walking to school in Toronto as a public health goal, and we're already there, so it's nice to know that. Um, but we match this with the injury data, and the little, uh, the, the little uh, stars are uh, pedestrian collisions uh, corresponding to the age group of um, kindergarten to uh, grade six. And what you can see is that the injury rate per thousand children um, includes plenty of areas where it's actually zero. There are places where you don't see um, any uh, child traffic injuries. And there are also clusters, um, and you'd expect this from some kind of a normal distribution, but we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail to find out what's driving that distribution. There are clusters where there's um, a lot of injury. The unfortunate thing if you do a straightforward regression is the more children are walking, the more children are getting pedestrian injuries. And that makes it look a little bit irresponsible to show up at the school and start the walk to school program uh, today until you actually look at um, what happens when you take a multivariable approach and when you factor in the environment in which children walk. So here's the multivariable model. And the multivariable model takes in all of the usual considerations around built environment that um, an urban person would talk to you about. What are the dwellings? What's the density of dwellings? Um, tell me about traffic lights, one-way streets, traffic calming for schools, crossing guards who help children cross the road or a particular factor, and the socioeconomic. This is a final model. We had uh, many more candidate variables than this before we built it, but the point here is that there's no longer a, an association between how many children walk and whether they get injured. That association has gone away. That association belongs to things like what's the dwelling density, what are the roads like, what are the crossings like, what are the crossing controls. So it's nice to know that at least in Toronto, it's the built environment that is driving the injury problem and that we have examples in the city where the built environment is good, where we're getting these things right, and the, and, and the rate of childhood injury is uh, low. This is all cross-sectional at the moment. Some of our other work has taken us into um, natural experiments and so forth around traffic. But it's a good conclusion. More walking to school doesn't have to mean more collisions, as long as the built environment is measured and is correct. If everybody's a pedestrian, there's a zero injury rate. If everybody's in a car, there's a zero pedestrian injury rate. Because we're in a mix and it's positive, there are going to be places on the curve where if you're promoting walking, there's more risk. And there are going to be places on the curve where if you're promoting walking, there's actually less risk. And these safety and numbers things are very well described. And I think our job as you know, health promotion and epidemiology people is to figure out what shapes this curve. And a lot of the shape of it is the, is, is the way that we build our traffic environment. The solutions may be a little bit different for uh, Tanzania compared with Toronto, uh, but the concepts are exactly the same. We want walking promotion for children, and we want walking promotion on this side of the curve, so that as we get them walking, and we can, and it's one of the interesting little uh, 
observations about um, speed control for motor vehicles. There are all kinds of things that have been tried to control motor vehicle speed because it's a magic bullet. The most powerful thing that you can do to slow a car down in an area of all of the choices is to put a child by the side of the road. When drivers see children, they go more slowly, period. Um, so we've done a little bit of walking work in Africa, and Africa's a big place, and Uganda's a medium-sized country with a population very similar to Canada's, but quite uh, condensed. And I'm showing you a map of Kampala broken into its districts for a region. So this is the, for a reason. So this is the Kuwempi district, and this is central Kampala. And right here at the bottom of Kuwempi is where the National Referral Hospital sits. So we wanted to look at the epidemiology of child pedestrian injury in uh, Uganda, and we chose an urban district uh, where we have the National Referral Hospital with a trauma registry kind of sitting at the tip of a funnel, because the trauma registry had been collecting information on child injury and all other kinds of injury for years, um, and we wanted to find out how accurate um, those data are compared with other sources that you might uh, choose. We wanted a community survey as a gold standard, and so what we were going to do was go and find out um, what's happened in the past year in terms of a pedestrian injury that you had a day of lost activity, what's happened in terms of death or disability over the lifetime. We took uh, 39 primary schools and took 20% of the population in each school because that's the only way that you get kind of a census kind of thing in Uganda is to work off school. Um, lists. And this was going to be our gold standard measurement of what's the size of the pedestrian problem. We also took hospital data and police data, and then because we were working with the schools, we used um, the uh, teachers, um, just got a volunteer and told them what the project was and had them log prospectively for a year which children are involved in uh, pedestrian crashes. And so they ran nine months of observation. The teachers rate was 7.6 pedestrian crashes per thousand students per year. The community survey said the truth is 8.1 uh, pedestrian uh, injuries per thousand children per year. The police data was not data, uh, but the number that we were able to get out of it was about 1.9 per year. And the hospital data showed us that even if you are in a catchment area that goes past the National Referral Hospital, if you're a child in Africa, irrespective of the level of injury, you're not very likely to show up in a hospital, and you're just a little bit more likely if you're a boy. So if we want to measure things about what's going on with road traffic injuries, community surveys are expensive. This prospective teacher data was very cheap, and this is either some kind of numerical lucky chance, but it has a big area of credibility about it. One of the things that was kind of interesting is that, you know, here we had a pretty stick, strict definition about what a disability day is, because you have to have some threshold for injury. And the teachers would write us all these things, and they would say, you know, Johnny got hit on the way to school today, um, but he came to school anyway. Um, and, and, and that was not something I'd anticipated from studying child pedestrian injuries in Toronto. And the children get run over by motorcycles all the time. But the motorcycles aren't very heavy, and it's sometimes a fairly slow hit. And you know, what's the child going to do? So they're going to go to school after a, after a traffic injury. So I think using survey data, using teacher data, or getting into the civilian space to get the epidemiology done is probably going to be a lot more important than going to hospitals or going to police departments to do road traffic injury and epidemiology in low-income countries. The reason that we collected this data was because we'd applied for uh, a randomized trial, one of my uh, colleagues who's a pediatric surgeon in, in, in Uganda. And uh, we get rankings between 0 and 4.9 in Canada from our uh, health research thing. I have set the record for spread, which can never be broken, <laughs> but I didn't get the funding for the randomized trial because we did get a 0 from the same group that we got a 4.9 from because we were actually audacious enough to think we should do something about this problem while we were studying it. And if you're talking about the ethics of participatory research, I still think we should have been doing something about this while we were uh, studying it. So here's a um, little sigmoid curve. It looks like an oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Anytime you're looking at the fundamentals of anything, and uh, if you see a sigmoid curve, that's where the action lies. 
This happens to be the impact speed in kilometers per hour of an automobile against the probability of a pedestrian death. 60 kilometers and above, the probability of a pedestrian dying approaches 100%. 30 kilometers and below, the probability of the pedestrian dying is trivial. Isn't it interesting how we set speed limits in the world just to make life somehow, I don't know, especially when the speed of getting through central London, for instance, has been the same since the Middle Ages. You can move at 12 kilometers an hour if you're paying for it. Same speed with a horse or a car. So when we look at our transportation systems, I think we need to look at some of the structural, fundamental things about how they can work. Um, because you can design a pedestrian transportation system that is zero risk and keeps the city moving. It's just a challenge to do it. William Haddon, when he was thinking through injury prevention in the 1960s, came up with this concept of a Haddon's matrix, where you take a look at person, equipment, environment factors at three different time periods before the event, at the event, and post-event, and think through the different things that you might be able to do. And we've been talking our way through some of the aspects, pre-event, environment things, are where I put my uh, money around pedestrian injuries. But this is needed as well. These sorts of things are needed as well. Some of this is needed as well. Speed control is needed as well. The nice thing about gridding out your interventions is that these are all synergistic. If you're going to suffer a bad traumatic brain injury, you have to fall through every hole in the cheese. And if you stop that somewhere, if somehow that driver doesn't cause the crash because they're not intoxicated, they're not on the cell phone, or they're not speeding, if somehow the visibility is there so that the crash is narrowly averted, or if somehow the child is more visible, or if somehow the particular environment for the road crossing um, takes the kinetic energy out of the system and the crash happens anyway, if any of those things happens, you don't get that crash. So if you can make a 10% effect here and a 10% effect there and a 15% effect somewhere else, you can actually drastically reduce. And that's part of the math behind what happens with a decade of action. So let's talk about child passengers. Who's been in a car recently? So it's an interesting consumer product, isn't it? We spend more on these than we spend on anything else, even after the invention of the <coughs> uh, and, and, and And yet you go and pick one of these things up off the lot, and this is your most expensive and person-defining consumer product, and it's actually unsuitable for application today if you have a child. Because if you've got a child who is under the age of nine, that vehicle is not sold with any safety engineered into it. And you go and talk to parents and say, what do you want in a car? Oh, I want children to be safe. And some cup holders. Um, so so, so I, 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 don't, I, I don't understand. But the result of that system is that we have children who receive disabling injuries and walk away adult uh, crashes. And apologies to Bruce Browner, who's seen these series. But very early in, in, in uh, Toronto, I looked at um, what happens to the children who come in to uh, our trauma program. Uh, and we worked with the engineers from Transport Canada who go out and retrieve the vehicle, retrieve the restraint systems, and figure out, put together a reconstruction. What happened? Why did it happen? What are the uh, countermeasures? Um, and uh, by working through that way, um, you can actually come up with some countermeasures that I'm pleased to say have, have made it all the way back out to the market. So these are our types of crashes. You can have a frontal crash that looks like that, a side impact crash looks like that, a rollover crash um, can go on and on and eventually look like that. That's four and a half full rotations. And any clinical classification system is going to have unclassifiable outliers as well. Um, <laughs> You also need a classification system for car seat uh, types, so 20 pounds, 10 kilograms, the rear facing catcher's mitt uh, type of uh, bucket. 10 to 20 kilograms for a toddler, still much safer uh, facing the back, and AAP is, is out uh, with position statements asking for rear facing much longer than the road authorities do for good reasons. And then for children who are um, more than 20 kilograms, 40 pounds, they still don't fit an adult set of seat belts until they're the size of a, a fifth percentile uh, female. And so up until about the age of nine, you're looking for a, uh, for, for a booster seat. Um, 
my older daughter has not yet done her driver's test, and she says the challenge of doing it rear-facing in a booster seat is what's going to hold her back. So, <laughs> um, so here are some of these crashes. That car, if you're the size of an adult male engineer who designed it, will allow you to sit here and get away with a wrist fracture and an ankle fracture. That is good engineering. And here we are with an airbag and seat belts and a crumple zone and all of these different kinds of things that modify the kinetic energy where it, where it sits. But that car, as provided, without a seat in the back, and I think anybody who's worked clinically knows about these sorts of injuries, where the, the, the child, um, and there were, two, uh, there, was a, there were two siblings, a brother and a sister in the back um, seat, who were both... Uh, the, the older one was uh, about the age of seven, the younger uh, uh, about the age of five. Both of them um, had this kind of, it falls into parental standard of care in our country. Not all of these children are in booster seats, and if they, they've been out of booster seats, they're never going back. Um, but the shoulder belt doesn't fit, the lap belt doesn't fit properly, the bearing is directly onto L2 or L3. And if you look at the MRI, if you look at the signal in the cord, that cord has been pulled because the strong nerve roots down here have stayed intact, but the lesions in the cord are higher up. And you're delivering uninjured adults from that seat and paralyzed children from that seat. That's not a system that's designed around the needs of children. Here's a little aftermarket device. Um, these have become more sophisticated over the years since we did this one. But when you're rolling over a vehicle, you are not generating a large crash force all at once. So in a frontal crash, there's a big, steep peak of 10, 15, 20 Gs of deceleration that lasts for a brief period of time. Here, there's a long sequence that goes on for seconds on end, where all of that energy is being gradually absorbed into the vehicle and into the ditch. These are very survivable crashes, as long as you stay inside the car. The shoulder girdle of a two-year-old girl is not a girdle. You can't hold a two-year-old girl by the shoulders. The shoulders are going to uh, retract. There are witness marks on her neck, and there are witness marks on her body from her being ejected from her seat during the crash sequence. But there are no marks at all on her arms because they're so soft they just go out of the they just go out of the way and get out of the uh, way. And as she came out of the seat, she actually managed to fracture her femur with a bending force against this front plate. With ejection from this vehicle, she landed in a reasonable spot, and this was her only injury as well as the witness marks. But again, here's a little aftermarket design that we're using that isn't entirely optimized for a child yet. And here's a completely survivable crash uh, for a restrained child uh, where she was at some substantial risk. This crash was very good because um, when you uh, when, when you get a vehicle tested by uh, NHTSA or, or uh, the um, Institute for Highway Safety, the, the collision, the, the sort of frontal collision speed that the vehicle is tested at is very close to the actual speed um, that this one uh, came out to. So this is like a compliance crash test done for the grown-ups. The grown-ups in the front seat were uh, a, a dad who was driving, a mom who was in the passenger seat who was pregnant. The outcomes were no injury at all. Mom, dad, fetus, they all did fine. This little girl was in the back seat, um, and she's almost three, um, and she was in one of these forward-facing devices, and she was fully, completely, properly restrained according to best available standards of the day, but forward-facing rather than rear-facing, and she's got an inertial injury at the top end of her spine rather than at the bottom end of her spine. And it's actually an atlanto-occipital dislocation. So that's not a good place to injure your cord. Her cord was intact, and she was fine. And she was treated um, with uh, spinal fusion and, and, and in a nervous collar. But this is not the sort of system that you want to design when the crash pulse that the car is being designed towards is a crash pulse that will keep the adults alive in the front seat and can apply forces that are substantially too great for a child in the back seat. And the crash pulse is going to get stronger for the automobiles that you're going to be buying over the next 10 years than it was for the automobiles that you bought several years ago. Why? Because we want fuel efficiency. 
and we want performance, and we want space on the inside, and we want collision protection when we've got all kinds of active systems that are designed around adults. And so there's now a design criteria for automobiles that says they're going to be lighter and equally powerful, and they're going to crash a lot stiffer. You're going to see a short, sharp crash pulse that you can absorb with airbags instead of a longer, lower crash pulse. And if we're not designing, if we're not designing that kind of what happens at the B pillar happens to the restraints, if we're not designing that around the needs of children, then we're going to see more inertial children's injuries and frontal crashes. Side impact crashes are hard. Um, side impact crashes, you don't have very much crush zone to work with. You don't have very much space to manage that kinetic uh, energy, but you do have some. And the side impact kids are the ones who look like child pedestrians with this triad of injuries, where there's a brain injury, there's a thoracic injury, there's a lower extremity um, injury, and it's all around um, intrusion. Even in a well-restrained uh, child, it's around intrusion into the vehicle. So it's good to understand what goes on in this system. It's good to understand the child restraints work and that there are particular uh, vulnerabilities that children carry, but it's important to do something about it. And you can't go and do a randomized trial uh, with or without child safety seats. But if you find, and I worked with a network of automotive engineers, and if you find a problem and give it to an engineer, then they come back with a solution fairly quickly. Here's the problem. This is actually a pretty good seat. This is a five-point harness. But this is a seat um, that would have been uh, state-of-the-art at the time that we started doing this work. This is a side impact crash that's being simulated, and of course the uh, seat appears to move towards the crash, and the seat belt that is attached to the car with isn't doing very much about that motion. So the seat's being carried towards the crash, the child's head is being carried towards the crash, there's nothing to moderate that energy at the child's head, and these crash dummies in silico or, or, or live, and we've worked with both, will report out on head injury criteria and say, yes, I got a severe brain injury, or no, I did not. There are several design ideas that arose from our review of this material, and here's a little software test of them. The first is let's just anchor this base solidly to the car. There's no need to strap it in with a seat belt. You've got those clips. You build some cross beams underneath, and now the seat doesn't move. So we do have a zone between that child's head and the window strike. And you'll notice we can actually keep the child entirely out of that zone by managing or reducing the motion of the base. The second thing we do is we make this tether a load limiting tether so that it gives the child some ride down room for a frontal crash or for a side impact crash. And the third thing we do is we add in some very simple padding for both the coup and contra coup direction where the child is going to get a head injury. So we're slowing the skull down over um, a shorter distance rather than over a piece of window glass. In software, this works fantastically well um, at preventing a head injury in what's a compliance level um, side impact crash. In the real world, it exists now. So the, with this engineering network, and they take the ideas and they actually put a lot of them into um, a consumer product that ends up going out on market. So with this rigid base, with reversing the thing up until the age of five now, and with this really clever thing for when you put the child forwards, there's a little piston in here that's going to squash and crumple. And that's how they're giving the child a ride down and an energy management for the frontal crash to make a lower and wider uh, maximum G curve you know, applied to the head and to the neck. So, so there's a design cycle approach that I just want to sort of illustrate here, where if you're working right where the kinetic energy is interchanged, you can change the way that that kinetic energy is managed. For occupants, this becomes um, a fairly important thing to do wherever it is that you are in the world, but this is not this is not the biggest part of the global problem. In Canada, it's the most sort of fundable part. You do need legislation. People aren't going to use seat belts or use booster seats by themselves. We've studied the effects of legislation. In a Canadian province, if you have legislation, you have a substantially higher rate of booster seat, booster seat use. In an American state, because there are more of them and they're more variable, we can look at the effect of laws on fatalities. Um, and there are actually 
20% uh, fewer fatalities in states that have enacted a uh, booster seat law. And it's probably going to continue, that gap will continue to sort of, uh, they'll, they'll fall more as booster seats wash in, as long as the effect of legislation can be maintained over time. Remember, though, that even for families that are using wheeled motor-driven vehicles, they're not, uh, they're, they're not driving Volkswagens. That's not the most popular uh, motor vehicle in the world. The most popular motor vehicle in the world is the 100cc motor, motorcycle, previously manufactured in Japan as the Honda Cub and now manufactured in China and going out. And there are all kinds of questions that arise when you realize that this is the practicality um, of how people are going to be moving around. But there are also all kinds of answers that arise, even in terms of mitigation. Boy, wouldn't that picture look a whole lot better with three helmets, even if we change nothing else, right? Even if we change nothing else, three little helmets would make me much happier about that. So there are all kinds of things that you can do um, to protect motor vehicle occupants. And again, this is where William Hatton um, started. Um, again, when you grid out the different things that you can do to prevent the crash in the first place, to manage the crash energy, or to look after the victims afterwards, um, you can move the slices of cheese so that there are no holes anymore, even if it's fairly holy cheese that you're working with. What about cyclists? Helmets um, have got three Cochrane systematic reviews about them. Helmets decrease head, brain, and severe injuries by 63% to 88%. Um, there are non-legislative interventions for uh, getting helmets onto children's heads, like handing them out, that sort of thing, promotion programs. And non-legislative interventions do work to get uh, more helmets onto uh, children. And legislation increases helmet use rates um, varies depending on what your baseline is and where you are, but legislation always increases helmet use rates, um, and the argument about whether helmet legislation decreases bicycling rates is still, uh, is still unsettled, but there's not a lot of strong evidence of that, it's just a suggestion. Separating children from uh, cars is um, very important. Um, significantly lower injury severity and better recovery for cyclists who were child cyclists who were um, in parks or paths or protected areas and, and, and injured and admitted to hospital compared with those uh, who uh, were struck by a motor vehicle and admitted to uh, hospital. So physical separation is um, very important. And one of the ways that we do physical separation in Toronto is by a line of paint, um, which isn't as substantial or chunky as some of you might want if you uh, want a bicycle lane. But even a painted bicycle lane that draws more cyclists to the area will drop the collision number on that street by about 20%, according to some of our pre and post uh, research. So we're after physical separation as well as a helmet. Visibility clothing, unfortunately, um, for pedestrians and cyclists, we're not seeing the effect yet. This is eminently trialable, and so there have been a lot of randomized trials of doing uh, visibility interventions, and it's not coming out as compelling. Um, and there's one paradoxical association um, from a very well done case control study that uh, Brent Hagel is doing in Calgary that shows for adult cyclists, the presence of highly visible clothing was actually associated with an increased risk of crashing. Um, and you can think about that and think about all of the hypotheses about human behavior and risk compensation and all of these things that I don't usually believe in. I mean, I can't give myself six times as much kinetic energy just because I'm wearing a helmet and I don't make myself six times as likely to crash just because I'm wearing a helmet. But the question about whether that is giving me a permission to go into a dangerous place that I otherwise would not have gone into perhaps does need to be asked if we're seeing these associations. What about just getting the children, you know, what about teaching the children to cross the road or teaching the children to ride a bicycle safety or teaching the children to do this, teaching the children to do that? I haven't spent a lot of time on education because I don't think it works. <laughs> it's human behavior. It's very difficult to change it. We've known since the 1950s that all you have to do is either not put the cigarette in your mouth or not light it, and you don't get lung cancer or cardiovascular disease. But how good have we been at a global level at, at, at changing the behavior around 
tobacco disease. And you can say pretty good, or you can say not very good. Depends which country you want to go to and which uh, line you want to follow. Um, but changing people, I don't think, works. Changing the environment that they're in does uh, work. And a systematic review of bicycle skills training interventions that we did was exactly like the uh, Oliver Dupre systematic review of um, pedestrian road crossing uh, interventions. You can see changes in behavior. They're brief. They kind of wear out after six months. You can see some changes in knowledge and attitude that are kind of easy to make. But there are no differences in injury outcomes. There's no way that you can train a child to be safe in an unsafe traffic environment. Yes? I'm going to withhold myself from saying too much, but just on this, what, where was this done? Wait, who were, who, where, what country? Uh, oh, yes, so that, that's, that's, that's the other part of the problem. The, the vast majority of the research is on safe populations in high-income countries, and the biggest gap in the research is have we tested interventions where the problem is, where, where the problem is the biggest. So that's, that, 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 that's a huge... Uh, important point about any of this skills-based stuff. Cyclists work in a similar way, in a synergistic way, with a Hatton matrix where we can think about all of the different stages and, uh, and, and, and interventions that we might make. Speed reduction is our magic bullet, if there is one. Whenever we're thinking about road traffic injury, this kinetic energy equals a half mv squared. I would love to see Taxation, fines, and licensure based on this equation, a half mv squared, right? Like if you want to get a license to move something around on the road, you just sort of multiply the, the mass that you want to move by the velocity you tend to move at, square the velocity, and you know that's what your license is going to cost. Or if there's a collision and somebody's hurt and you're trying to decide who pays, uh, you can go to court for the next five years, but why don't you just do this? Let's weigh the child. Okay, let's weigh the truck. Okay, now we'll just apportion the cost out. I don't know, it's too cute. But, um, but speed reduction does work for all crash types and all road <laughs> users. And the low-income country road users are very often pedestrians where you get, in the kind of range of speeds that we see in human spaces, you can go from almost 100% risk to almost 0% risk if we really concentrated on speed reduction. So here's this decade of action where if we do nothing, we stay on this upward trajectory to 2 million deaths a year. And if we implement what we already know about pedestrian, cyclist, um, motor vehicle occupant uh, safety, and there's a big knowledge, body of knowledge for children, and children have typically been behind in high income countries and in low income countries, but a kind of a raw, rapid knowledge diffusion, implementation, evaluation step is actually going to allow um, you know, a, a, a million lives saved, and more than 10% of those are going to be kids. Research, education, clinical care, I think need to overlap in your clinical life. And I think <coughs> one of the uh, greatest challenges for the 21st century is trying to figure out you know, how are we going to get clinical care um, to uh, the billions of people who are currently excluded um, from receiving care. Um, and I also think that one of the neglected tropical diseases that we uh, deal with now or should think about is injury. And for road traffic injury, you've got all kinds of solutions. So I want to thank you for your attention and questions and anything else that uh, might come this way.